All right, this is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. I have none other than Yvette Cornell here um, on my show today to have a great discussion about um, Boyce Watkins and his recent vi video about the racial wealth illusion or the racial wealth gap being an illusion. Um, I want to let Yvette Carnell chime in and then I'll give my opinion and we're going to have an uh, informed and educated discussion about why that's just ignorant, plainly. Hey, Breaking Brown family. Hey, your Black World family. <laughs> um, I just want to thank everybody for coming through and having this conversation. A lot of you have been in my inbox recently saying, check this Boyce Watkins video out. You have to respond. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do today. So here we are today. Um, I've been, I've been getting a lot of requests from people, my subscribers, my followers, to really watch this Boyce Watkins video. I've watched it. I've shared it with uh, Sandy Darity, with Dark Hamilton, with a few other economists as well. It's highly problematic. I mean, I think he, here we have everything laid out on the table, a total misunderstanding of what the racial wealth gap is supposed to show versus what it actually interprets for so many people. And... You know, just at the crux of it, Boyce is describing the gap as though it's a gap. And that's kind of been my argument to both Darity and Shapiro. Me and Darity will be doing a, a paper exposing why that's a problem to call it a gap. But as though we're just behind. The context of this is actually white America owns 90% of the national personal wealth. We own as a grace of... 14 million families, 40 million people, less than 2.6%. And the boomers have most of that 2.6% in residential property. What this discussion really should be about is whether African Americans have the tools to access the American dream. And I think for a lot of people, they're getting so confused and Boyce Watkins' message is highly problematic and not based on any data. You wanna chime in? Well, I just want to provide people, if, if you haven't watched the, 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 Boyce, the, the Boyce Watkins video, just go over there and look at it before you watch this video so you understand what we're talking about. And I'm going to give you a summation of what, the, of, of what his video is. His video says, yes, white people have everything, but we don't have to worry about them having everything, but we can still have white dreams. So he's basically saying that white wealth doesn't matter. They're human beings too. We all have two legs. We all have two feet. And that's the most consequential thing. And that's a total misunderstanding of the role that wealth plays, especially when we have historic inequality. You and I have talked about Thomas Piketty. We talked about the book, Historic Inequality, that has rendered us an underclass in this country. And he's saying, well, if you do your best to just do the best you can, wherever you are, that's enough. And I think what I'm saying here in my conversation with you is that that's just not true. Yeah, and so and so we're gonna dissect this video in in a moment. But but you know one of the things that I see is in his video he talks about black people being here and white people being here. What it, what it denotes is, is a clear misunderstanding of basics of, of, of economics and the reality of of the of the storyline of America. But it also disassociates race from wealth and race from history. This has a history. You know, I'm wearing a shirt. I'm pulling up a chart that actually reflects this shirt. Someone made this uh, shirt off of that chart, sent it to me. Thank you so much to them. We are conscious uh, com, I believe is the website. And uh, what I'm showing you is that slavery was for hundreds of years. Slavery was then followed well into the well into the 30s and 40s. It didn't just end when everybody said, let the slaves be free, as, as so many of the history books kind of teach us. It was well into the 30s and 40s in so many places throughout the Deep South. Then we were followed with Jim Crow. And it wasn't just about color. It was about locking black, blacks out and keeping them in a secondary uh, status. That's your great-grandfather or even your grandfather. Then that was followed by mass incarceration. The mass incarceration of primarily African-American males, taking them out of the economic market, and ensuring that they will stay in the status that we're in today. Boyce Watkins acts like all of that is an illusion and none of it is. He gave you a video where he refuses to use numbers. And I always say, show me the numbers. Show, and as Yvette says, show me the receipts. And I guess for me, what I have a problem with is I'm looking at a guy who keeps talking about where he's traveled or where he's traveling to or his PhD 
but he's not bringing up actual research that he's done. I, I've interviewed Thomas Shapiro, the guy that term, that came up with the term racial wealth gap two weeks ago. You can check that out on my channel, Tone Talks. I've interviewed Sandy Darity, one of the leading intergenerational economists, meaning legacy economists in the world, African-American male, cool as a fan, and we're going to be working on something together on this in, in this area of the racial wealth like expansion gap difference. I've interviewed Byron Allen, who's a billionaire now, because he had to sue AT&T and Charter and Comcast because of being excluded from being included in the marketplace. Boyce Watkins continuously brings you random opinion that he just thought about yesterday, as he said in his video. And you have to ask yourself, where am I going to get the things that ground me from? Data, research, and of interviews or just some random ideas of what I feel like I want to say today. Yeah, I think I think I think if we're talking about financial literacy, you know, financial financial literacy and accusing black people, what you're basically saying is that if black people make different choices, the outcome will be different. What Boyce Watkins doesn't do is address the, the the most significant part of that argument, which is that we've done financial literacy better than white people. The, in terms of white people, in terms of their, in terms of unsecured debt, their rate is 47 percent of unsecured debt. Our rate is 45. Okay, that was in the Darity report. That was. If you want to read that, you can check that out. Antonio's going to put up. You can check that out. But if you look at that, we have done that. Our savings rate is better than white people. We save more. We edge out white people in terms of how much we save. We've done financial literacy better. So the real question is. How or why has financial literacy failed? That's the real question. And then when you say to me, I shouldn't compare myself to white people, like white people. Wait, 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 wait. Event, event, we're gonna, we're gonna, de we're gonna dissect his video in sections and get to all of it. What I want to do, because we have new, we have people from Boyce's channel from around the web that don't know the data. What I want to do is, I did a racial wealth gap in sixty seconds viral video. For those people that have seen it, I apologize, but we just need to set a framework. Because everybody comes in here with the with the idea, as Boyce said in his video, that black people are in a one point five million dollar house and white people are in a ten million dollar house, and that's where the confusion about a gap actually comes from. So, like, let me run this racial wealth gap in sixty seconds. We'll come back and we'll start this discussion piece by piece on on Boyce Watkins' racial wealth illusion video. Tone Talks brings to you the racial wealth gap in America, explained in sixty seconds. In America, there are 190 million whites living in just about 82 million homes, while there are 40 million blacks living in just over 14 million homes. To truly understand the racial wealth gap, you must look past the income of these families and evaluate household worth. According to Demos.org, in total, white American households own 90% of the national wealth. In contrast, Black Americans altogether own less than 2.6% of the national wealth. With most of this small sliver being in the hands of black baby boomer retirees, black working age families are largely invisible nationally in terms of wealth. To give a clearer lens, the bottom 50% of American households control only 1% of the national wealth. And of the total 14 million black households, Likely over 10 million black families fall into this bottom group that owns nearly no wealth. The racial wealth gap is real and it's growing. While 10% or about 8 million white homes are worth $1.4 million or more, according to Slate.com, when you deduct the family car, 50% of African American homes or over 7 million black families are worth no more than $1,700. Subscribe to learn more at tonetalks.org. So now that we're back, what I want to start off with is really going back to what was something that, that uh, Yvette just alluded to. Um, professor Professor Sandy Darity and Dark Hamilton of the New School. Sandy Darity is a professor, again, at Duke University, at the Dubois Cook Center. And essentially, he's one of the leading economists in this area. And he did a, he did a report. It's 18 pages. I'm pulling it up right now. I'm going to let Yvette chime in on it because she just covered it on her show that shows financial literacy is not the solution to the racial wealth difference between whites and blacks. It will not solve the issue. It will not even correct the issue.
Can you chime in on what it shows? What What he talked about in that study is is, is something that I want to hit on. Well, having that equal stability, and in terms of the frame that people use to target communities for inferior products, we're talking about inferior schools. We're talking about inferior grocery stores. We're talking about inferior amenities. They race is the central determinant for targeting people. So they target our areas with that because of who we are as an underclass, because of everything that came from Jim Crow, from slavery, all of that, from redlining, from, from housing discrimination. That's what we see, and that's what Darity talked about. And when you look at the fact that wealth is stability, and stability is what you need if you want to build a business. You can't be insecure and build a business. We don't have it. And he talks about predatory loans, too. He talks about the fact that we have, there's no access, access to capital that we have that is not predatory. That's a debt trap. And that's so... And so much of this, and I did a video on celebrity, post Cosby, post Michael Jackson. We have a generation of people that just don't understand what black is and what white is and how it's constructed in this country differently than it is across the globe. This country had chattel slavery for hundreds of years and then it had Jim Crow. We talked about that earlier, but it's not like in the past. That is the very essence that defines like why whites have advantage. And it's not just done at the private level. Government codified this through allowing slavery, which was a legal institution. It was codified that, that slaves were slaves. It wasn't just like private people had slaves and they was hiding them from the government. No. And then also we have redlining, which is, which is essentially the, fe the, the, um, the federal government marking neighborhoods where black people live as D minus. If we look at Atlanta today, so many black homes are actually depreciating assets. You know what's ironic about that? You're not supposed to count depreciating assets and wealth, but we have to do that just to get to the 2.6% that we're at. We own less than 1% of the rural land. And Boyce Watkins is talking as though we own 30 or 25%. It's all fantastical, but it's not real. And I challenge him to actually come up with data that shows that we own this plot of land that he speaks about and they have a bigger plot of land. No, they have all the land. And the reason they have all the land is because this situation was structured for them to have that advantage. If you look at what Shapiro talks about the land grabs, like how white people actually became white, the middle class that was created during the New Deal that we were cut out of, for him to tell you essentially that all those things don't matter is a disrespect to you, your family, and the history of this country. Yeah, and we talked about the fact that when you say, he says, it's at one point he says something to the effect of, you know, just take care of your own and don't worry about everybody else and don't compare yourself to white people. But like I say, no matter where you are, you have a grocery store, you either have a Kroger or a Publix or a Ralph's or a Safeway. If you go into that grocery store, they don't have black money and white money. Money is money, right? In the richest country in the world, money and money, money is money and cost is cost. And we have to pay the same for a loaf of bread as they do. We have to pay the same for, for orange juice as they do. We have to pay the same for a gallon of milk as they do. We live in a world where we have to, we have to have the price to pay. We're in the richest country in the world. So that means that you have to pay the cost for the richest country in the world. And what has happened is they've stolen it. So they have what it takes to pay the cost, but we don't have the tools and the income to pay the cost. I don't know if many people know that, know this, but more than 15, more than 50 percent of black people are living on less than on less less than like thirteen dollars, thirteen dollars an hour. That's from that's from economist Richard Wolf, right? That's from him. So we're looking at us not making any money. Yes, I I, I have to agree. I have to agree, and and like it, it's a trip because I think for so many people that are, are viewing this, they view him through celebrity rather than scholarship. And this isn't, this isn't about celebrity right now. Stop telling me about your PhD and tell me about your works. Tell me about your research. You can watch, look, look, I challenge you guys all to go back to my channel and watch my interview with Thomas Shapiro from two weeks ago, or he very like, like he really leans more. So he talks a little bit about where he went to school, but not in the context to define him. He leans more on the work that he's done getting out and doing research. There's no research undergirding these opinions of black privilege existing by Charlemagne or by, or a voice walking saying that the racial wealth gap is an illusion and that, and that men hyping you up on the idea that we need to talk about the greatness of black people. 
he's making conservative arguments like the welfare queen in, in a sense and then basically using your own need to feel in, like you have control and agency against you and my thing today is to give you the data and, and you can look around at your own families and if you got you know this string of family members that are worth hundred fifty thousand dollars that's good for you i guarantee you that's not a normal case because the middle black family in this country of three is worth seventeen hundred dollars when you take out the family car the fundamental problem is that's not enough to access the american dream the other problem is that you don't just want a regular american dream as an african-american you want your kids to go to college and for that matter to go to ucla you know how much howard is right now not harvard howard it's forty thousand dollars if you got a middle family worth seventeen hundred dollars to get in the top five percent of black families all you gotta have is 350 how many people can pay cash to go to howard that are african-american descendants of slaves very very few maybe less than one percent of all black families yeah, and I, and, I, and I think I think that goes to the heart of the issue, right? Like when you talk about wealth equaling stability, when you talk about that, one of the things he says in the video is that most black people don't know real poverty. Yeah. For you to say that, for you to say that most black people don't know real poverty, he says, well, you have an iPhone, you have a TV. And I don't think what he understands is that capital needs me to have an iPhone. Yeah. I don't go into there and lay a thousand dollars. You can't, you can't do Uber. You can't do Uber without an iPhone. Can't do it. You can't, they lease you the iPhone. They lease you the iPhone. The reality is we're in a first world country that is predatory. So they give you stuff so that you can be part of the system, not so you can own it. That's the new world. He's he's telling you stuff from the fifties. He's an older man telling you stuff that maybe his grandparents told him. You talking to somebody, right now you talking to somebody in me who, who's coming from new age stuff. He's telling you stuff that's dated. That is not accurate for today. Well, let's talk about dating, right? He, one of the things that he talks about in terms of what well, you can start a business too, in terms of dating, you know the reason why they can start a business when you look at those people from back in the day? Because they were monopoly busting. People were busting up monopolies. If, if all these people, you couldn't have a conglomerate, right? But now you got Walmart. Amazon. Got, and let me tell you a story. For those who don't know, that was a black meat company, meat packing company. You can check this article out in the Washington Monthly article about black business. I'll, I'll see if Antonio can get it up. But we, let me tell you what happened. He said, this guy came forward and said, I want to, as a black person, I want to try to bring this black business back up to where this black business can do business and can be competitive. What he found was that the four major white meat packing companies had it all locked down. They had a monopoly. He couldn't even get distribution for his black business that had been around for decades. This was an old black, it was like the Carter uh, meat packing company or something. This was an old black business. He couldn't get it back up because they had locked it down. That is the consequence of white monopolies and white capital consolidating power and consolidating wealth. And he don't want to talk about that. You have to talk about what they are doing to consolidate their wealth and why black businesses fail. There was a very good article that same Washington Monthly article talked about how many banks have gone down. Talked about how many insurance companies we had then versus now and how how. And, and 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 so much of that is built out of a model that that came from uh segregation you know um you know segregation allowed for a lot of things to go wrong for us but in, in many ways it allowed us to isolate and grow separate and apart from like white wealth now that we're integrated we are effectively in many of these cities largely prey i'm pulling up an article that came out two days ago in the atlantic about mississippi and it's not just mississippi that you're seeing this that's effectively they're using the black population in this in this town or um, as as economic prey to fund the the town when the sales taxes are low. So even if you don't you save and you don't buy anything because and then because when you buy something you don't know the difference between the sales tax and the actual uh, like item it's all together. So if you save and you say I don't want to buy anything they're gonna force you to still pay taxes by getting you for seat belts and broken lights poverty crimes is what they call them. But they're not doing that to white people. This isn't a guess. This is in the Atlantic. I'm pulling it up right now. Then you see the same thing in Ferguson. This is across the nation that black people, black Americans, African Americans, descendants of slaves are being used to fuel the American ecosystem and white life that has 90% of the national wealth. Boyce said one statement that I just wanted to totally debunk, which is for black people, we're the richest kids who's the poorest kids in a rich neighborhood. 
I mean, he never uses data, and like you should question anybody that just tells you stuff. That makes no sense. That shows no understanding of the basics of financial realities of America. Black people are not rich. The middle black families are seventeen hundred dollars. To get in the top five percent of black families, all you gotta have is three hundred fifty thousand dollars hard. That's in the, that's in the first world country. Black people are largely a working class group that doesn't have enough work to do in this country. That's the narrative. And as long as people like boys say things like that, it fuels us to believe that we are the problem, not government. All right, let's, when you talk about government, let's break something down for people, okay? And then I'll talk about, then I want to talk a little bit more about black capitalism. When you talk about government, I want you to consider something. I want you to consider that American car company that have been here for decades needed government to provide an infusion of capital for them to stay afloat during the boom and bust, during that bust of the recession. I want you to understand that that that, that banks needed government to come in with billions of dollars to help them stay afloat. These are white banks, okay? I want people to understand what that means because capitalism will always have booms and busts. That's the nature of capitalism. And for you to say that these white people need these multinational white corporations needed money to stay afloat, but black people don't need government. It makes no sense. You thinking about billions and billions of dollars that they got in bailouts. Now think about this. Black banks were 10 times less likely to get bailouts than these big banks. That's government not acting for black people on the behalf of black people. They didn't get that. And understand, understand what that means in terms of your ability to operate as a bank. That means that you don't, you're not able to take on the same risk and know that you'll be saved. You can't compete. If they know that they can be as risky as possible and then know that they can be bailed out, they basically can shut your bank down because you can't provide the same, uh, r the same interest rates back to the customers. So they're not going to come to your bank. It, it, it's a double edged sword. Yeah. And think about this. When you talk about government, the problem is so many people who are talking about voice, you're not talking about government, you're talking about yourself and believing that you have agency. But there was a bill passed called Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank put burdens on small banks in order to bail out big banks. Okay? And so, black banks are small banks. So you're talking about government putting a burden. We're talking about the market putting a burden on small banks, that's black banks, and bailing out big banks. And, 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 ju and just... Let, 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 let's keep let's keep moving on on on, the, on these points on his thing, you know he has this concept of, of of uniqueness and specialness that's like magic. It doesn't make sense. He talks about he's going to do things that other people can't comprehend. Never trust anybody that says I'm gonna do something that other people can't comprehend. Just show me what you're gonna do, and then show me the people that actually re get the results from what you're talking about. You don't have to sell me on no magic, and I, I think for a lot of us. What's ending up happening is people study the, the oratory, like styling of preaching, and then use that in other formats from politics we saw with Obama, and we're seeing it with economics with voice, and it, it, it makes you remember a spirituality, a religious like kind of backdrop, and it makes you stop looking at the numbers. What did you give me, President Obama? How many people have you produced, voice Watkins, that have become the supposed millionaire? Cause I, I look at, you know, we're going to get into the specifics of, of some of the issues I have with his programs. Cause so many people keep coming to me asking me, well, what is the answer to what Boyce Watkins is saying? And I just wanted to have one video, particularly after he has such a, a, a trite video taking, a, I feel like a direct shot at Yvette Carnell show two days ago. And also the whole reality of, of the study of racial wealth. And I, I, I feel like when you look at, how he dissects information, there's just problems there. He, he talked about, as an example, just to give you clarity, pulling up something right now, um, there was a study, he calls it a news report. There's a big difference between the two. It's not a journalistic news report. There was a study done that it would take 228 years for a black family to reach the wealth level of a white family today. He talked about it incorrectly. He made it sound like it's about catching up to them in 228 years. Did you read the study? Or, and you gotta ask yourself, did he read the study if he doesn't know that basic tenet? It was saying, if the wealth level that a white person, white family is at today, it would take 228 years on the current path for a black average family to reach the same wealth level today. I know the people who wrote the study. 
You know why? Because they're my editors at inequality.org. You know, you know, and, 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 and they work at the IASP. They're fellows. These are economics researchers. They know what they're talking about. If he wants to come with conflict like data that refutes that, it doesn't exist according to Thomas Shapiro. But if he wants to come with that data, he can that shows that the middle black family is worth $300,000. And then he'll have to show us all these middle black families. It doesn't exist though. Yeah, no, it, do, it doesn't exist. I mean, it's, it, the, the problem is it's not anchored. It's not anchored in anything. It's not anchored in anything. It is, it is almost cultish in terms of the way you- It's know. magic, it's magic. Yeah, it's magic. But here's the one thing I wanna say. Revlon, there was an executive at Revlon in 1986 that said there won't be any black beauty care products. It's gonna drop dramatically. Um, you know, there won't be any more. Don't worry about it. This was a Revlon executive said this in 1986. And it was right because they knew what they were gonna do to the market. And they knew the cost of entry to the market in terms of black business. So when you see Carol's daughter and other people sell, you understand why. And when we talk about capitalism, what are we talking about? Let's look at Magic Johnson, right? Magic Johnson owned a bunch of Starbucks that I think he eventually sold. It was just, it was, it was a mechanism to get black people to enjoy Starbucks and have him make money. You talk, you talk to me about the rush card, which was sold to Green Dot. A bunch of black people running to do business with black capitalists, and the black capitalist sells. That's kind of what black capitalism is now. It's just to get black people into the market so that they can get money from white people and say, I have a whole bunch of black people selling this. That's what it is. But nobody wants to, nobody wants to have that conversation. And, 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 and that, that allows me to transition into another part of this misconstrued idea of wealth that Boyce keeps perpetuating, which is to use spending power as a measure of wealth. He keeps like contrasting black people's spending power to spending power of, of other countries. What you have to understand, those other countries are using real resource, not credit. So like as a, as a black person, if I go buy a Ford and I put a, a, a $500 down and the Ford was $40,000, that's $40,000 of spending power, but I can't take that $40,000 and buy anything other than that Ford at that interest rate that they tell me. It, I don't really have that money. In many other countries, to buy a home or anything, you gotta have the real money. So you're looking at people who are trading oil, coffee beans, wheat, all kind of hard resources. I come back to it. We own 1% of rural land. I'm not dealing with the why. I'm not dealing with how you change that. What I'm saying to you is that the reality is the consequences. You don't have resource. Now the question becomes why? It's because you come from a descendancy of African-American slavery, chattel slavery. And then you deal with why isn't it changing? Well, as a direct result of the messages perpetuated by people like Boyce, what's happening is you don't understand how to make that change. You don't understand how integral government is in making that change. He said one line that, that was so damaging that I, I, I just wanted to read it to you, which is universe, the universe isn't supposed to create a world of fairness. Not gonna happen. Tell that to the slaves that walked off their plantations when Lincoln said, let the slaves be free. Tell that to the grandma that you have that worked her way up to the post office because the government forced them to give black people jobs and now she's retired. Tell that to yourself because you went to college on grants and loans and were admitted on affirmative action. Nothing that he's saying jives with the reality of how we actually moved and progressed to the point that we are at as African Americans. The universe is supposed to create fairness? No. The American government is because they stole fair. Well, I, I want to point to one other thing, and I'm, you know, I'm going to read from something. Now, I don't usually read from anything, but what I want to, what I want to point to is you always point out incarceration, right? And those yeah. rates have gotten worse. We're talking ten thousand per one hundred thousand. But what you have to understand, if I can't make anything else clear to black people, when you see a rate that's that high, wait, let's let's frame, let me frame it because uh, I framed it before. I did a piece on on incarceration. Um, it's, if you Google black male incarceration, it comes up one or two. And what I showed is that it's a catastrophe. It's, it's a catastrophe. Um, one of the highest rates that we've ever had of incarcerated was in South Africa during apartheid. That was 800 per 100,000. That's 1%. That's le actually less than 1%. That's high as we've ever seen in the first world. Black males between 20 and 39 are at near 10% today. 10%. And that's not even counting probation and parole, which jumps it to 20%. Basically, it's a prison state. 
Now you might say, well, they must be doing something wrong. No, when you look at everybody else, including African-American women, African-American women are 300 per 100,000. Everybody else just doesn't go to jail for the same stuff. That's just systemic choice. That's just what it is. But let's point out, that's a systemic failure. When you don't get numbers that high without a systemic failure, that's not an individual failure. So the problem with Boyce's project is he's telling you that's an individual failure. Mind your own business. That's a, but that's a systemic failure. Let me read you one other thing, because you talked about incarceration in South Africa. Well, let's read this. That's true. But the black-white wealth gap is greater today than it was in South Africa during apartheid in 1970. Whites yes. own 15 times more than blacks in South Africa. In America, whites own 18 times more than blacks. Since 1970, the percentage of African Americans in the middle class has declined. That's what we're dealing with. See so you, and you have, and you have to contextualize that by having everybody understand. During, you know, I traveled to South Africa for a few weeks, um, maybe a year and a half ago, and the, they explained that during our civil rights. What their group was done of the same age of the Martin Luther King age, they left and went into the bush and learned to kill. So what happened was when apartheid happened, they was about to kill a lot of like white American, I mean, white South Africans. And under that threat, Nelson Mandela negotiated a 7% redistribution of lands, 7%. Do you know what would happen? So like, basically when you look at what happened with African Americans, we never had that moment here. They haven't even apologized really for slavery. Everybody likes to talk about Bill Clinton, but he wasn't doing that officially as, as president when he did that weak apology. What I'm saying to you is that we have never had the moment that addresses the consequence of what we were put through here legacy wise. And we're in a time where all that matters is legacy. We are in a time, according to Thomas Piketty of Capital in the 21st Century, if you look in Yvette's uh, bookcase, it's right there behind her, where wealth is calcifying like we've never seen before. But as wealth calcifies, so does legacy. I did a piece called Rise of Legacy. You can check that out. And I talked about this. This is where we're at now. It matters that you came from a slave. It matters that you came from Jim Crow. And if you want to make it not matter, you have to demand more of government and you have to force white people to come off all of the, 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 the Scrooge McDuck wealth that they're swimming in. Yeah, because white people don't want to do business with people who used to be slaves because they know we don't have money, we don't have leverage. So the people, they have to come in and say, you have to do business with these people. That has to be government. There's no other entity that's big enough to say you have to do business with these people, right? And even if even if you see, like, I, it, it, when we talk about voices, thing, he said, you know, most black people don't know real poverty. But he also said, you know, you, you don't have chubby people in poverty. Yeah. And so I want you to look up, if you're Googling this, look up food deserts. What you find in a lot of poor black communities is they don't have fresh, they don't have a lot of, in terms of fresh fruits and vegetables. The cheapest food is the highest in fat, is the highest in sugar. So that's how you see poor people getting chubby. You don't even understand the basics like of how we're getting chubby and then you're comparing us to a first world country. Like, like, go to, like listen, if you go to a store and you look in the food bin, like go to a store and look in the food bin, the bargain food bin. You all know, if you know it, like I know, you go to the bargain food bin. Look at that food bin. There is no kale in that food bin. There is no arugula in that food bin. There are no carrots in that food bin. It's usually cookies and stuff and juice and stuff that's high in high fructose corn syrup. That's all stuff that makes you fat. That's all stuff that makes you overweight. So in this country, in this country, in America, the richest country in the world, not having money means you can buy cheap food. That's also the stuff that's going to make you fat. Yeah, and, and you know, to end the dissection of the video, and then I want to move into a general, like, kind of clarification of my position on some of Boyce's basic premises is I don't understand what, what I don't think he has a basic understanding of, of wealth or, or economics in this country. I mean, he keeps counting countries against, against our race. Like we are, like we're a separate apart, like kind of landmass similar to the Haitians or something of the sort. And, and we overthrew the government and we have our own government. It's just, not, that's not what you see from Mississippi to Alabama to Ferguson and beyond. And I think that, what what's happening as a result is in making black people feel empowered he's gutting the things that you need for them to feel frustrated enough to create good black politics and he's making them blame themselves instead of blaming the greater system 
And in doing that, none of that is supported by data. I'm going to say that to you today. None of that is supported by data based on Thomas Shapiro, Sandy Darity. Uh, when you look at, pull, I'm going to pull up something I did with uh, Byron Allen. It was, it was given to Barack Obama, the eight solutions to make America great again. None of those solutions are about you buying stocks. All of those solutions are real. And they're about what Obama could have done to help African-Americans. But you needed a fervor among African-Americans to understand that they needed to demand Obama to do those things. And that was gutted by these kind of politics where you say things like the racial wealth illusion, the racial wealth gap is an illusion. Anything you want to say on the video before I move to his greater like <laughs> principles? No, I think, I, think, I think one thing you have to understand from the video also, and I'll just add this, is that, you know, he says, when he talks about the iPhone, I want everybody to understand, even if you don't get an iPhone, even if you have paid cash, which we don't, that's not wealth. We have to understand that, that, that $1,000 or $800 or whatever the new iPhone is, that's not wealth. You know, he says we coexist with white people. We don't coexist with the, they run it. We, we're, you know, the, the bottom 50% of Americans have 1% of the wealth. And we're in that body, bottom 50%. All of our working age families. So like, all, all, like we have very few families, we have 14 million families. I, I count like one and a half million, maybe two million that are above that bottom 50% line. Um, but what you actually see is, because uh, understand this. Out of how many families? Let me, let me, ex many let, me, let, uh, let me explain, let me explain this though. To be at the top of that bottom 50%, you need about 85 to $90,000 in household worth. Bottom 50% of America has less than 1% of the wealth. And to be at the top of that bottom 50 you need to have about eighty-five to ninety thousand dollars in household worth. Well, our middle family is worth seventeen hundred dollars without the family car, and to be in the top five percent of black families, all you need is three fifty. So we have a nominal amount of black families that are above that line. We, like I said, we're, we might have two million, two and a half million black families that are almost all boomers that are above that line. That doesn't mean you're successful. You're just above the group that is dreadfully behind and poor. But almost all of our working age families, like black families, are in the bottom 50%. None of what Boyce is saying will provide a solution. What I provide as a solution, and I'm going to be doing a paper with Darity kind of around this concept, is first and foremost, we have to demand that white America gives up the advantages of whiteness. Um, Shapiro just did a report. It was kind of covered by the Very Smart Brothers. I'm pulling that article up. And it said, and it basically says that, um, you know, the very smart brothers summarize it that blaming black people for buying weaves and Jordans has always been, and will always be bullshit. And what, what this is, is a report that talks about the advantages of whiteness. One of those advantages to give you how it's baked into America is since 1984, for every dollar of increased income for an African American, we only saw 60 cents of gains in wealth. From, from 84 to 2012. For white people, for every dollar of increased income, they saw $5 of wealth increase. That isn't just due to choice, that's due to the advantages of whiteness. Meaning you can put money into your home, be white, live next to other white people, and the appreciation exists purely on the fact that you guys stay away from black people. Purely as a fact that you exploit black people. You have to understand what's going on in Mississippi isn't just about the town or the city needing money. It's about them wanting to keep the black people out and using the police like private security to do that. Understand what you're seeing. And, and, and if you don't understand like race, you can't understand wealth because race undergirds wealth in this country. I mean, look, before we go on to the next section, let's just say one other thing. The, 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 what, regardless of what you think about Boys, the, the, what he's using is do the best you can from where you are. That's a conservative ideology. That's what Republicans tell us all the time. You do the best with where you are. You're lucky to be in America. They'll even tell us you're lucky that you were taken away from Africa. Do the best you can in America with what you have. That is the exact same thing that Boyce is saying. My problem is that if, if you said that, if a, if a conservative said that, if Donald Trump said that, y'all would be living. If Donald Trump said that y'all would be upset, and I'll compare it to this. I don't want to genderize it too much, but if a, if a woman came into her home and told her husband, our, our neighbor that lives in a better neighborhood, that lives in a mansion across town, just snatched my pocketbook, and he didn't do anything about it, what would you think of that man? And would you tell that woman, don't worry about it, just deal with 
the money that you have now. Don't worry about the money that you ain't got no more. Because the one thing, if you want to read this, you know, I, I, there's a there's a great article by Tanasi Coates about reparations that talks about everything that was stolen from us. So how can we talk about where we are and what we have to do by not talking without without really focusing and honing in on what was stolen from us and how to get it back? What's the process for getting it back? What's the politics for getting it back? Because politics is going to get it back. You doing for self is not going to get it back. We have to get it back through politics and policy. That's how that happens. You're not going to get it back by starting a black business. And you're not going to get it back through labor. And you're not going to get it back through labor. I, I mean, this it's, it's, so, it's so like weird to be talking at such a i mean the guys with a phd but like labor is not what it was so we'll move into the meaning the wealth class the the the, the top part of like white america is taking all the gains labor is not taking the share it was taking in the 60s and the 70s and in the 80s and as a result that's why you see so many african americans working themselves in three and four jobs talking about they grinding and they hustling but really not living a better life than their parent who wasn't college educated. And you know, those parents worked at nine, came home at five and owned their house. I'm talking about own their house like in, in 10 years. And I think that you don't understand the, the, the rub of it all is to make your house $500,000 and make Jordans a hundred dollars and you get as many Jordans as you want, but you'll never have your house or make student loans a hundred thousand dollars. And then, and then give you a job afterwards where you make 70 and your parent used to make like 25 or 30, but they didn't need a college education that was a hundred thousand dollars to access that 60. This is America. And people will say white people are going through that too. And I'll tell you, they got classes. I'm pulling up a chart right now. Black America is really flat. There's nothing that you can say about it. This was done by demos.org. If you look black, I think is the, is the green line. It doesn't even lift. It doesn't even lift. White is the blue line. You see what the blue line does? You see that two and a half million? That's just that doesn't even count their top five percent. Because you cut those off for, for as aberrations, Oprah and Jay Z and Byron Allen. Those are all aberrations. But for them, even without the aberrations, they have millionaires. Because millionaires are not aberrations in white America. That is the narrative of what happened in this country. Black bodies created wealth that is still in the in, in the economic ecosystem that you're competing against with your own labor today. You're competing against your grandfather's own body. Think about that. And so like we're looking at the overall arc of things. I just want to look at three or four things that he talks about. People have asked me to address it. One is this idea of stock picking. I don't think it's as it, what the way he presents it in any way explains stock picking. I don't, uh, you know, he doesn't explain how you, how you evaluate companies. He just talks about the greater like idea that companies always go up. He doesn't explain the reality of whether people actually have the wealth to invest, let alone risk the loss of that investment and what happens if they lose it. He just takes this idea that it always goes up. No companies go bankrupt and they take your money. And, and, and especially companies that are, that are high risk, high reward, they even have a higher potential of going bankrupt. It's, and, and so like, I think for us, by making it seem like we can pick a stock, it's just like it, it fits into the narrative of, 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 of lottery and numbers running, and it makes it seem like we can have a quick solution to a very long problem that we didn't create. You want to say something about stock picking? And also, what also makes it seem like the solution to, to, to our problem as black people is, is investing in white companies. And I just don't see how the solution to what we face is investing in, in white people. It's very funny that people tell me, People say, oh, Yvette, you're depending on the white man by depending on the government. But people never tell boys, no, you're depending on the white man by depending on that he's going to do the right thing by these white companies. How is me calling on my government, who I pay taxes to, different than you saying that you're going to get your freedom through white stocks? That is a problem. And, you you know, I had somebody tell me who invests on Wall Street, derivatives and stuff, said, Yvette, listen to me. Wall Street is math. It's math and it's insider knowledge. That's what it is. And we don't even, you don't, you're not teaching the price to earnings ratio. You're not teaching any of the things because you're talking about fees that could be charged. You're talking about, you know, how they swindle the whole game of getting the social security to go privatized is so that you can, they can get more money from you. They're all about swindling money. That's what these people do. And you're telling us to go and do that and invest like three shares or whatever we got. Not understanding that that's going to get eaten up. There's no leverage. There's no scale. And that's, that's the, that's why, that's part of why that, that philosophy is problematic. And there's no information of when to get in and get out. 
You want to you wanna, uh, expound more on white companies and Maven and things of the sort? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I, I, I just want to give people a bit of background, right? And I want to say this, and I want to say it very carefully in terms of how I present it to you. I live the limitations of black capital. What people don't understand from, like, 2011 to, to, to late 2016, Weiss and I worked together in your black world. I wrote approximately... Eight to ten stories a day for your black world. The, but what I face there is the limitations, right? The limitations of black capital. So in a month, I never got, in a month, like in the height, I never got paid more than $1,200. Even when I did Breaking Brown, like half of that went to, went to, went to your, went to, went to Boyce Watkins because I was trying to promote it through his channels and that was his business model. And I'm not faulting him for that. What I'm saying to you is that he had to do that because he did not have access to white capital. That was never an influx of money to his, to your black world, even though we had people, because the people that we have don't have the money to buy the products that a lot of advertisers want to sell. And so that was the limitation of black capital, right? That's the limitation that I live. Our readers are poor. Even when you look at the numbers of people in YouTube, you know, voice has like 200,000 people. Right, compare that to a guy who does like silly videos and he does video games. PewDiePie has 50 million. And Voices Network YouTube is mostly news. So you have to ask yourself why there are so few black people coming to, 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 to YouTube to get news. And the second thing I'll say is this. For Voices say we don't need white people, I'm on YouTube. He's on YouTube, right? We're both on YouTube. That's a white company. We haven't created our own YouTube. You can't say we don't need them. I got a press release the other day that said, you know, Boyce had joined forces with Maven, which, you know, which is another, he, he's, he's, he's transferring his digital properties to Maven. That's a white-owned company. Maven has gotten $3 million in, 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 in an infusion by selling their stock. They have $3 million. So that's, that's part of the reason that you have to do that. This is just the limitation of black capital. And the reason I work with boys because I believe in black media. I still believe in that. I think we did some good work there. I do. So, but I'm saying that, that, that you know, what I'm saying is, though, I took the sacrifice. I never made enough money to pay rent, really, right? So, what I'm saying is that I have lived the limitation of black capital. And that's what, it's no fault of voices. That's what he had to do because he didn't have no money. So, this is what we have to deal with. And I'm speaking from experience in terms of the limitation of black capital in America. In the money in terms of the money we don't have and don't have access to. Let's talk real data. You know, I, it's it's a trip because watching his videos, the hardest part is it just doesn't have any data. So like there's 40 million, 42 million blacks, but we have like 16 million workers and this the spending power that everybody keeps leaning on, which Jared Ball has debunked. What it what it actually is is it a bad metric even in inter- the better comparison is to look intercountry, not country to country, not comparing us to Kenya and to other countries. That's just not accurate. I can't explain it any other way. But if you look inside of the country and you look at Asians as an example, they have 8 million workers. So we have 16 million workers, 42 million people. They have 8 million workers. Well, while we have about 1.2, I think $1.4 trillion in spending power, they have nearly a trillion just with half the workers. We don't buy a lot of big ticket items, treadmills, uh, you know, we don't buy, you know, the, the biggest uh, flat screen TV. That's all mythology. What we mostly buy is toiletries, thing, food, things to get by in life. And so what, what Yvette is describing is the, is the consequence of that is advertisers for a treadmill that has a, a screen that connects to a, a, a trainer live doesn't advertise on BET. That's not their market. We're this comes back to the core premise that we're close to whites that undergirds like Boyce's whole analysis that's inaccurate, which is that we're a rich kid and we're we're a rich kid in a in a neighborhood and just the poorest of the rich kids. No, we're a poor kid that was that was owned by the rich kids that now is outside looking at the rich kids saying I'm gonna have that house too. But you don't need government to make sure that they give you the house that you're owed because they use you up. That's what we are. And so, like, the next thing I kind of wanted to deal with is, you know, Boyce keeps talking about $5 a day or he has another one where he has, you know, $100 a a month 
and then you can make your kid a millionaire by 30. You know, I'm pulling up a, a, a sampling of $100 a month, what it actually leads to as, as a principal is like $30,000. What you'll actually have when the kid turns 30 is around $126,000 if the market goes perfectly right. Like 8% returns every every year. 8% is high. You know, that's what, uh, you know, pensions are getting that with the top mutual. They they aren't getting that. They're really getting like six and a half, seven and, and, and fighting. What you're seeing is that Boyce Watkins is using math that isn't actually like sound to make you feel like you have a chance, which is even with the best math, you still end up with $120,000, not a million dollars. The problem we have right now is that you need certain amounts of capital to access the American dream. I'm pulling up an article right now by Timon out of MIT that shows the majority of Americans will live a are living a developing country life today. Well, we're all we're in the entire our entire group almost is in that majority. We just don't know it. And my thing is I want to make sure you know that instead of telling you the way that you can change that before you know the reality of your condition. Well, I think there was one part in the, in the, in the, in the voice video that he said, you know, don't don't compare yourself to, 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 to white people. They're not, you know, they're, they're not the gold standard. Well, they're not the gold standard, but they own all the gold. <laughs> That's the issue. They're not the gold standard, but they own all the gold. He said, don't compare your black excellence to black mediocrity. This is a pep talk. Yeah. And the thing, I, I, just want, I just want people to, like, I just want people to understand. The reason that I'm doing this is not all oh, Yvette and Boyce are going back and forth. I am concerned. I am concerned that this will neutralize our black politics. I am concerned when he says, come off the come off the plantation, the white plantation, and start your own business. Because I work for his business. And, and I made more money at the white plantation. I'm saying, I'm, and, and I understand that's a sacrifice that I made. I own it. But I'm saying that, like, be very careful in terms of what you're telling African Americans to do. Because we don't have the wealth that they have. They can fail and get another get another infusion of capital. Fail again, get another infusion of capital. That doesn't happen for us. That doesn't, and, and, and it's, I'm going to end on a neighborhood work study that was done. And what that study showed is that blacks, the highest rates of, have the highest rate among all groups of no save, of families with no savings. So effectively, here's a guy who is, who, who, who is telling black people that they need to save more and doesn't understand why they don't have no savings. Well, they don't have no savings because in Mississippi, they're getting poverty crimes at higher rates than anybody else. Well, they don't have no savings because they didn't get inheritance from their grandfather because he was stolen from on a sharecropping farm. Well, they don't have savings because their great, 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 great grandfather was a slave. I think that you don't, that the context and the reality of the American story and the American narrative is lost to Boyce Watkins. And I, I just challenged the whole idea that a wealth gap doesn't exist. You know, the other thing that neighborhood work study showed is that 47%, 47% of black families have no savings. Only 19% of, of white families have no savings. We don't, we are not living a, a, a solid first world life in this country. We have to stabilize ourselves, ask ourselves why that's the case, and then move forward. Because if we don't do that, none of the solutions will work that Boyce is proposing. Well, I, I think one of the things I want to address um, is that people keep saying, oh, Yvette, you're just be moaning and you're being depressing and you're, you know, you, you, you're, 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 you're a Debbie Downer. I'm not telling you to be depressed or be down. I'm telling you to get your politics right. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't do anything or, or, there, or there are no solutions. What I'm telling you is that the solutions are political. The solutions are not individual, they're political. So I'm telling you to get your politics right. Don't characterize me, don't characterize me as someone who is telling you, oh, just be depressed, oh, woe is me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the future is in politics, and that's always been our future in this country. When you talk about how we got included in Social Security, when you talk about how this, when you talk about the Civil Rights Act, when you talk about civil, all of that was politics. So now for you to say, we don't need politics, when everybody else gets politics, you're, you're becoming part of the problem. And I want him to push back from that and come back from that and say, you know what, I made a mistake. Because this is a problem, our politics. We, this, this sort of rhetoric, and I want to I wanna make this clear, neutralizes black politics. It makes black politics ineffective at challenging white capital. And that's what we need. So much.
Josh, thank you so much. I, I, I'll add to this that uh, it's not just you that is saying that. It's Thomas Shapiro. It's Sandy Darity. It's Byron Allen, the billionaire. This is just the reality of, of, of what needs to happen is government intervention into the whole ecosystem of how wealth moves in this country. So again, this is Antonio Moore from Tone Talks. Please go to uh, tonetalks.org, donate, subscribe, go to uh, Donate Brown, uh, to Donate Brown, correct? Yeah, DonateBrown.com. To DonateBrown.com to uh, subscribe and donate. Uh, share this. Let's get a dialogue going. Um, I look forward to hearing the comments. Thank you. Thank you.